Hello and welcome back to the video series dedicated to the Construction Safety and Health Book Overview. Today we are going to discuss part four and that's the last part of the book and that is dedicated to other safety and health issues and practices. This part consists of a few chapters, chapter 17 through 21. So chapter 17, let's dive deeper into this chapter. And that is all about preventing violence in the workplace. Dealing with workplace violence involves such activities as hazard analysis, record analysis and tracking, trend monitoring and incident analysis. Although it is important that employers consider the rights when dealing with the workplace violence, it's equally important that they act prudently to prevent harm to other employees and customers. The exclusivity provision of workers' compensation laws provides employers with some protection from liability in cases of workplace violence, provided the incident is work-related. When this is the case, workers' compensation or workers' comp is the injured employee's exclusive remedy. A violent act can be considered an on-the-job incident, even if it's committed away from the workplace. Specific guidelines have been established by NIOSH for determining whether a violent act can be classified as an on-the-job incident. The concept of crime prevention through environmental design has four major elements, natural surveillance, control of access, establishment of territoriality, and activity support. The author has uh, added another, administrative control. The OSHA has provided voluntary advisory guidelines relating to workplace violence. Although the guidelines are aimed specifically at the service sector, they provide an excellent framework that can be used in the construction industry as well. The framework has the following broad elements, management commitment and employee involvement, worksite analysis, hazard prevention control, and safety and health training. And this concludes chapter 17. Let's dive deeper into chapter 18. And that is about bloodborne pathogens in the workplace. So let's uh, discuss what is actually important here. Uh, symptoms of the onset of AIDS include the following enlarged lymph nodes that persist, persistent fevers, involuntary weight loss, fatigue, diarrhea that does not respond to standard medications, purplish spots or blotches on the skin or in the mouth, white cheesy coating on the tongue, night sweats, and forgetfulness. These symptoms, although associated with AIDS, are not unique to it. They're, they are cause for concerns, but not panic. HIV is known to be transmitted in three ways, sexual contact, blood contact, and mother to child during pregnancy or childbirth. AIDS is not spread through casual contact, such as handshakes, toilet facilities, eating utensils, or coughing. High-risk groups with regard to AIDS are as follows. Sexually active people who do not take appropriate precautions, intravenous or IV drug users, and people with a history of multiple blood transfusions. AIDS is having an impact on the workplace in the form of higher insurance premi premiums, time on the job losses, decreased productivity, cost of AIDS-related lawsuits, and increased stress. A corporate AIDS policy should have at least three components, employee rights, testing, and education. Federal legislation relating to AIDS includes the Rehabilitation Act, 
OSH Act and Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Other legal concerns include state laws, case law, testing, and company policy. Testing identifies the presence of HIV antibodies. For initial screening, the EIA test is widely used. For verification, the IFA and Western blood tests are used. A well-planned AIDS education program can serve several purposes, including providing management with the facts needed to develop policy and make informed decisions and fostering positive behavioral changes among employees. An AIDS education program might consist of any or all of the following components. One-on-one -on -one counseling, referral, posters, a newsletter, classroom instructions, self-paced multimedia instruction, group discussion sessions, or printed materials. When counseling AIDS-infected employees, construction professionals should proceed as follows. Listen, maintain a non-judgmental attitude, make the employee aware of the company's AIDS policy, and respond in accordance with the company policy. Construction professionals can use the following strategies for helping those with fears about AIDS. Establish an AIDS education program, conduct group roundtable discussions, and correct inaccuracies, rumors, and misinformation about AIDS as soon as they occur. The following precautions can help reduce the chances of contacting AIDS abstinence from sex, mutually monogamous relationship with an infection-free partner, avoidance of multiple sexual partners, avoidance of sex with a high-risk person without taking proper precautions, avoidance of use of intravenous drugs or not sharing needles, and use of a protective device while practicing actual or simulated CPR and use of safety syringes. The hepatitis B virus poses an even greater threat than HIV. Hep B is caused by a double-shelled virus. Hepatit hepatitis uh, B is transmitted through blood, tears, saliva, and semen. It can stay alive for years in bodily fluids. The hepatitis C virus infection is the most common chronic blood-borne infection in the United States. Approximately 36,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. Hepatitis C is transmitted primarily through direct exposure to blood. And this uh, consists the chapter 18. Let's move to chapter 19, and that is all about stress, ergonomics, and behavior-based safety. So what uh, is actually important in uh, this chapter is the following. Stress is the harmful physical and emotional response that occurs when the requirements of the job do not match the capabilities, resources, or needs of the worker. Workplace stress involves a worker's feelings resulting from perceived differences between the demands on the job and the person's capacity to cope with these demands. Sources of workplace stress include environmental conditions, work overload, role ambiguity, lack of feedback, personality, personal and family problems, and role conflict. Other sources of workplace stress are tax complexity, lack of control over the job, public safety responsibility, job security, lack of physiological support, and environmental safety concerns. So let us move to chapter 20, which is about environmental safety 
and the standard 14,000. So the most important things in this chapter are the following. Environmental problems currently facing the United States include acid rain, ground level ozone, global warming, water pollution, toxic wastes, and the garbage. The federal agencies most involved in environmental safety and health are OSHA and the EPA. In 1990, these two organizations signed a historic memorandum of understanding in which each agreed to work with the other to collect data, conduct inspections, and provide training. One of the most important pieces of federal environment legislation is the Clean Air Act. It contains provisions to reduce hazardous air pollutants, acid rains, and smog by significant percentages. The act deals with urban air quality, mobile sources, hazardous air pollutants, acid rain control, permits, stratospheric ozone provisions, and enforcement. Measures taken to clean up and protect the environment are ethically right. They may also be cost effective. However, research into the economics of a clean environment is limited at best. Research is needed to determine the effect of the country's investment in a clean environment, not only on people's health, but also on inflation, unemployment, growth of the GNP, the international trade balance, productivity, research, innovation, and other economic factors. And this concludes chapter 20, and we're moving to the last chapter of part four, and that is chapter 21, promoting safety. So the most important things from chapter 21 are as follows. A company's safety policy should convey the following messages. A, a company-wide commitment. B, expectation that employees will perform their duties in a safe manner. And C, the company's commitment includes customers and the community. From a legal perspective, an employer's obligations regarding safety rules can be summarized as follows. A, employers must have rules that ensure a safe and healthy workplace. B, employers, employers must ensure that all employees are knowledgeable about the rules. And C, employers must ensure that safety rules are enforced objectively and consistently. A fundamental rule of management is, if you want employees to make a commitment, involve them from the start. This is especially important when formulating safety rules. Safety training should be a fundamental part of any effort to promote safety. Safety training ensures that employees know how to work safely, and it shows that management is committed to safety. Well-run suggestion programs promote safety by one, soliciting input from the people who are most likely to know where hazards exist, and two, involving employees in a way that lets them feel a sense of ownership in the safety program. Safety committees can help promote safety if they are properly structured. The composition of the committee can be a major factor in the committee's success. The most effective committees are composed of a broad cross-section of workers representing all departments. Employee and management agreement is important in promoting safety. Fortunately, safety is an issue on which employees and management can usually agree. Incentives can promote safety if they are properly applied. To enhance the effectiveness of incentives, the following steps should be followed. One, define objective. 
Two, lead by example. Three, develop specific criteria. Four, make rewards meaningful. Five, keep communications clear. Six, involve employees in planning the incentives. And seven, reward teams. Competition can promote safety, but it can also get out of hand and do more harm than good. To keep competitions positive, involve employees in planning programs of competition and encourage competition between teams rather than individuals. And that was all about chapter 21. And this concludes our efforts on covering the part four, which was the last part of the textbook. And let me remind you what chapters are in the previous videos. Uh, part one, is theories and concepts. Part two is OSHA's Construction Standard 29 CFR 1926 and related safety practices. Part three is all about the application on the job. And part four, the one that we discussed in this video, is other safety and health issues and practices. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your time.